Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda Church this morning. I'm the pastor, Paul Prather. I'm so glad that you're tuning in on Facebook Live for this morning's sermon. Um, I'm going to talk this morning about how do I know God loves me? Does the Bible say that he loves me? How can I be assured that God cares about me? And how can you be assured that God cares about you? It's going to be a great thing to talk about. I hope I do it justice. But first, let me uh, make a couple of quick announcements. One is, if you're watching this and it speaks to you or you know somebody you think it might speak to, please share it on your Facebook page. We've gotten a lot of traffic that way and uh, a lot of people have been blessed. I hear from people literally from California to the New England, everywhere, Florida, uh, who watch these sermons. So put it out there if it blesses you, and uh, this might be something that will help somebody. The second thing is we have music also on my Facebook page where you find this sermon or on the Bethesda Church Facebook page. And uh, John Prather and Jim Bean have both posted songs. I know those will also lift you up and, and touch your heart. And it's good to have some music to go along with the sermon. The third thing is stick around at the end of this sermon because we will have communion today at the, at the end. And uh, if you're a member of Bethesda Church, you should have received your communion uh, kit from Kathy Spencer and, and her crew. And I just want to give them a shout out this morning. We've had so many people that have been so faithful over these months that we haven't been meeting in the building. And one of those is Team Spencer, which has delivered communion every third Sunday for 10 months now. Yesterday, they drove as far as Versailles to get communion to uh, my son and daughter-in-law and, and grandchildren. And I thank you all so much for that. I also want to thank um, Liz Prather and uh, Katie Henson and Andrea Cornett for organizing the drive-by blessing for Diane and Ronnie Brooks this week. That was just such a great thing to get to see everybody and, and to bless Diane, who's been kind of under the weather for quite a while and ha has a battle on her hands. And so it, it just touched my heart. And thank you all for doing that. We've just got so many good, faithful Jesus loving people that it just sometimes almost overwhelms me. So thank thank you all for doing that. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get right to the sermon and then we'll have communion. Father, in Jesus name, I thank you for bringing us here together this morning. And I ask you for your anointing on my words that my words we know are not adequate, but your words are. And so let my words be your words or your words be my words, but let them go out in spirit and truth and not return void, but would accomplish what you sent them to do. Lord, give us listening ears and open hearts to receive your word as we talk about one of the most important subjects in the universe, which is your love. Lord, shed your love abroad this morning as we study your love from the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A lot of people have a mistaken uh, view of God and his love, and I preach on God's love a lot because so many people just don't understand about it because a lot of times they were brought up in uh, religious traditions where what they heard about was God's anger and God's almost hatred for people and God's wrath. And so they always think God's out to get them. I, I felt like that when I was growing up. I felt like, you know, God was uh, eavesdropping on every conversation and peering over my shoulder and basically just waiting for me to mess up so he could hit me in the head with a hammer. That's kind of where I came from. And when I really had a, an intersection with the Lord in my life and, and I got to know him, what I discovered was everything I had been told about him was not true. It was just untrue. It was what I experienced from him was the most overwhelming, encompassing, 
unconditional love imaginable. In fact, it was beyond my imagination. It was unlike anything I had ever experienced in this world. And so I talk about that for people because so many people just need to know God loves them. You know, so the question is, does God love me when I'm good, but does he hate me when I'm bad? Well, the central story of the New Testament, at least, is God's unfathomable, unconditional love for every single person on this earth. That's the most reliable, time-honored testimony we have is from the Word of God itself, which consists of the words of those in the New Testament who knew Jesus best. You know, they a lot of them had walked with him on this earth. St. Paul didn't walk with him on this earth, but he had such a revelation of God of, and of Jesus that he explained him in a fullness that nobody else has ever been able to do. And one of the key elements to what they always talk about is God's unconditional love. He doesn't love us because we're special or we're good. <laughs> he loves us because he's special and he's good. And that's who he is. He is a loving, all-consuming, unconditional God. He is special and he's good. That's who he is. John said, uh, the gospel writer John, writing in a letter, let, well, I'm going to try this again. A later letter, that's a tongue twister, said God is love. That is the definition of who God is. He is love. You see, we're not the heroes of the biblical story, and that's where we get messed up. We think it's all about us. It's really not. It's about him. Life with God is not a me proposition. It's a he proposition. And what it really depends on is not who I am, but who he is. And fortunately for you and me, he is love. Let me read you this passage from 1 John. I'm going to, I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture this morning. And I think that's because you know, that that's valuable because while people don't necessarily love to be read to, it's important to read the scripture because that scripture is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It has a power uh, and it, it touches lives and hearts and souls when we hear the word of God written in the Bible's own words. This is 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. This is real love. Now get this. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Now, that's that famous passage where John says the entire nature of who God is is that God is is love. He doesn't just have love. He doesn't just show love. He actually is love. And that even when we were at our worst, when we were sinners, when we were hostile to him, when we didn't want any part of him, he loved us even then. And that's when Jesus came to die on our behalf is when we were yet hostile to him. You know, so many people think, as I said at the beginning, that God is going around judging and beating people over the head and wagging the angry finger and shooting down lightning bolts at people. It's just not true. It's just not true. John 3.16 is one of the most famous passages in the New Testament. You, you used to see it on placards at football games and all this. One thing that's always bothered me about everybody quoting John 3.16, which is a great scripture. I'm all for John 3.16. 
but is that they stop there and they don't go on and read the next couple of verses because the next couple of verses are even better in that they amplify what John 3.16 says so that you can't make a mistake about it. Listen to this, John 3.16. This is John again, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. He did not send his Son into the world to judge the world. Write that down somewhere. Write it on the inside of your hand where you can look at it. Carry it in your wallet. He did not send Jesus into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be delivered through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. Amen and amen. Here's one more, and then I'll stop on the scriptures for a while. I know I know this can get heavy and, and boring, but these are good scriptures. Pretend it's not Paul Prather just reading to you. Pretend that in this case it's St. Paul talking to you. And this is what he says in Romans chapter 5. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for the good person someone would even dare to die. <clears throat> but God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved and delivered from the wrath of God through him. God is not aiming his wrath at us, particularly once we believe in and accept his love. Then, then all the wrath goes away. God is not a wrathful God. That's not his nature. But so many people live in fear of his wrath that it's not until we accept how much he loves each one of us and that he loves me as an individual, but he loves you as an individual, that we begin to see that fear of wrath lift. And we realize, wait a minute, that's not who he is. That's not what he's about. He's not out to get me. He's out to bless me. He's out to love me unconditionally and love you unconditionally. The principle of God's love is built around the idea that we're all sinners every last one of us, and yet God chooses to love us fully and unconditionally anyway, and he loves us lavishly, and he loves us forever. It's hard to comprehend because nobody on earth is like that. No human being is like that. I, I like you as long as you treat me fairly reasonably okay and you don't do me any harm and you're not hostile to me, we'll get along just fine. But you turn on me, then ooh, I, don't, I don't know about that. But the Bible says that's not how God is. Even when you're hostile to him, even when you hate him, even when you blaspheme him, he still loves you anyway. Our part in this is really twofold, and I'll get to this in a minute. What are we supposed to do? How does this affect us? Well, the first thing is we have to accept his love, by which I simply mean, you know, it, his love doesn't do you any good if you refuse to believe in it. If you just say, well, I don't believe God's like that. that. That don't even strike me as reasonable. Uh, well, that's a bunch of uh, heebie-jeebie nonsense. Well, then that love is not really doing you any good, is it? Because you're still going to be as, as wrought up and messed up, mad and bitter as you were before. But when you accept his love and you say, you know, I actually, I believe that. I believe he just loves me and it lifts that burden and you're out from under all that condemnation and that fear and all that stuff. When, when you just surrender to his love, it frees us, it delivers us, it saves us in a sense. 
And what it does is when the, all of that is lifted, is it, it enables us and equips us then to manifest that same love to other people. Once we begin to comprehend how fully God loves you and me, then it frees us to love other people because we're not caught up in our own mess. We're not caught up in our own hard feelings. We're just like, whoo, this love, this is good stuff. Well, praise the Lord. We become conduits of God's love toward other undeserving people. We start loving God's other creations, the least of his children. I've been reading a book. One, one of the ways I got on this sermon this week is uh, an old acquaintance of mine who is an author, a very well-known author in Catholic circles, uh, Margie Ralph, Margaret Nutting Ralph, sent me a copy of this book of hers called Does the Bible Tell Me So? And it's a look at all kinds of doctrines and teachings people have and then answers the question, is this really in the Bible? Does the Bible actually say this? And one of the chapters that I liked a lot, obviously, is Jesus loves me, does the Bible tell me so? You remember the old little children's song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so? Well, she says, okay, there's the statement, Jesus loves me, is that actually what the Bible tells me? And the answer she comes to absolutely, conclusively, is yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's what the New Testament is all about is that God has been slandered. God has been portrayed as this big ogre in the sky who just delights in smashing things and stomping things and breaking things up. And the New Testament actually says it's not like that, that God loves you more than you can comprehend. Here's a, here's a quote from Margie Ralph's book I pulled out because she just says it better. I was going to say it. Uh, in my own words, but she says it better anyway, so I'll just give you her version. She says, while it, it is true that the Bible tells me that Jesus loves me, it is also true that Jesus loves everyone else. Therefore, to be in right relationship with God, I must be in right relationship with God's other beloved children. I must not judge or exclude others. I must always be willing to forgive others. I must share my material goods with those in need. I must not have wealth or worldly renown as goals. I must realize that I have not earned what I have. Rather, I received all things as gifts. Whenever I use scripture to justify behavior that results in other people being marginalized or excluded, I am abusing scripture. The measuring rod is love. Amen, Margie. What a great statement. For Christians, for the Bible, the New Testament, the measuring rod is always love. God's love toward each one of us and toward every human being on earth. And as I said a minute ago, once we receive that love and we accept that love, once our eyes are open to recognize that love, then the other thing that happens by God's intention and by God's commandment is his love begins to flow through us then to other people. We become free to be conduits of his unconditional love. And that means you can love people you don't even agree with. You can love people you don't even like. If you're a Republican, you can love those Democrats. If you're a Democrat, I'm telling the truth now, you can love those Republicans, okay? If you're white, you can love black people. If you're black, you can love white people. And both of you, <laughs> the white and black, can love Hispanic people. And if you're straight and you're a Christian and you believe in traditional morality, well, amen. But that's no excuse for not loving gay people and every other people. You got to love everybody because God loves everybody. Here's, a, here's another quote from Margie I like. It's about the story of Zacchaeus, the sinner who was called by Jesus 
and he was a tax gatherer, and you probably know that story, but here's her commentary on that. Jesus sought out sinners, so Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. Those watching said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. They were already wagging their fingers and all that. But he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. This is a true statement. However, it would be a true statement no matter in whose home Jesus chose to dine. <laughs> Even yours. Those who complained evidently didn't realize that they too were sinners. And that's, that's the gospel. We haven't tapped into God's love until that love makes us love others. We haven't understood God's love so long as we still feel superior to anybody. His love is the great leveler. When we realize how little we deserve, how, much, how little I as an individual deserve to be loved as extravagantly as he loves me, all right? then it has the effect of humbling us and freeing us and opening us. And we look at other people and we realize they're just messed up too. They're messed up like we are. But Jesus died for them just as surely as he died for us. And he loves that person, whatever his or her fault. He loves them as fully and as surely as he loves me. And if he doesn't love them, then he doesn't love me. But fortunately for all of us, he does. He loves us all. It's not that the Lord can't accept us or doesn't love us until we reach that revelation. He does love us and accept us. Even when you're being a bonehead and maybe even a bigot, he still loves you. All right. But his love doesn't really become effective in you, and it doesn't set you free, and it doesn't set other people free until we recognize the magnitude of his love for everyone, all right? So you've got to understand that, yes, absolutely, the Bible says God loves you. Oh, but Brother Paul, you don't know how bad I've been. Well, get over yourself, okay? It's not about you. And unless you're Stalin or Paul Pot or Hitler, I'm telling you, there have been a lot of people a lot worse than you. Maybe some people better than you, but a lot of people a lot worse than you. But it's not about you. It's about the love of God. It's about him, okay? And you're not bad enough to make him not love you. You couldn't be. He would love you anyway. All right. So just accept that love. Take it on. Let it set you free. Just say, I believe it. I'll take some of that. I'm going to walk in that. And then what you will find is as you really embrace his love for you, as I said, it will create love in you and acceptance in you toward other people. You will be able to love people you didn't even like before, okay? You know, before I came to the Lord, the people I really didn't like were Christians. I'd had what I considered some bad experiences in church, and I really had very few, little patience for Christians, even though my dad was a preacher and my mom, you know, was a faithful Christian and all that. By and large, I didn't like Christians, and I really didn't like those like born again, spirit filled kind of Christians because they all went around with these stupid little grins on their mouths all the time. Mm -hmm. Bless God, we'll praise, praise the Lord. And I just say, nobody's that happy. Get over it, you know. Come on, give me a break. And that's the way I felt until I got zapped by God's love myself. And he revealed himself in my heart. And I felt that overpowering love that transcends everything. I felt it in my soul and it set me free. And I found out, I found myself going to church with those people and loving them and giving thanks to God for putting me among some of the same people that I couldn't stand before. See, the problem wasn't with them. The problem was with me, my old hard, gnarly heart, you know, 
who I didn't love God. I didn't think God loved me. And consequently, I couldn't love anybody else. But when the love of God comes into our heart, it changes everything. Listen, Romans 8, 1, another scripture. Therefore, therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus, that is, in his love, in his power. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. You see, when we're under the law of sin and death, that's that's what I'm talking about. When we think God is up there judging us for everything we do, and that if we sin, if we mess up, he's going to get us, and he don't like us because we told a lie to Aunt Sudi or whatever the it is you've done, uh, you know, and, and you think you're under, that his love for you depends on that law, then there is no freedom. It's just all condemnation. But when God's love through the agency of his Holy Spirit breaks into our lives and we realize God is not holding our trespasses against us. It does what the law could never do, which is it sets us free. It, it lifts us out of condemnation, out of self-condemnation, and gives us joy and peace and love. And ironically, this is a whole nother sermon, but it actually frees us up to not commit a lot of those same old sins we used to commit a lot of the things that we used to do under condemnation over time when we've experienced his love we don't even want to do those things anymore you know because love changes everything his love changes who you are and how you see god and how you see yourself and how you see other people and how you see life on this earth that's the great thing about god's love Romans 8, uh, same chapter on down, and I'll close with this. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Jesus loves you so much, he's interceding for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's just saying, Father, look down there. Look, look down there at my son, Paul, Paul David. Boy, I love him. Isn't he doing good? Now, everybody else may look at me and say, what a bonehead, what a jerk, what an idiot. But Jesus is interceding on my behalf. He is my counselor and he is my attorney. And he's up there the whole time arguing my case for the good. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For Get this. Now listen to this. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. I'm about to bust Pentecostal on you here in a minute. If I had the room, I'd jump. If I had the space, I'd jump up and run around this little room right here, but you wouldn't be able to see me because I'd be over behind the camera. So anyway, in closing, then what we what do we do? First, we must accept this love in order for it to do its work. Until you believe it, until you embrace it until you just say, okay, God, I'll take some of that. He still loves you just the same, but it doesn't have the effect until you take it, okay? 
You know, I can give you a new car. It doesn't do any good until you accept the keys and get in and drive. Okay, so take the keys, get in the car of love and drive it. All right. And then God's love, if we've really seen it and felt it and understood it, will begin to flow through us toward the whole creation. His love for us will begin to enable us to demonstrate that love to other people. So if you want to feel and experience God's love for you, then demonstrate love towards somebody others think is undeserving. Find you some unlovable old bum and love them. Do something nice for them. And every time you become a conduit for God's love, you will feel more of his love for you. He's not loving you because you did something nice. He loves you anyway. It's unconditional love. But when you do these deeds of love toward the undeserving, what you're doing is you're freeing up the space in your heart for more of God's love to flow into you. you you're sort of uncorking the dam. You're unplugging the dam, and that love just continually flows. So become a conduit of God's love. Well, praise the Lord. That's my sermon for today. We're getting ready to have communion now, and what a good time to do it at the end of a sermon like that. Not because I preached it great, but because the message of God's love is the greatest message of all. I'm trying to get my head out of the way here so Sister Elizabeth can be seen. Uh, we're getting ready to have communion. I'm going to pray, and then we will partake of this. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your unconditional, unfathomable, undeserved love. And Lord, let us receive that love as we receive this communion, and let it flow through us to other people May it flow out of our innermost being to the entire world as we proclaim the kingdom of God as a kingdom founded on and driven by love. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he met with the disciples in the upper room with the twelve. And it says that he broke the bread, and he said to them, Take eat of this, for this is my body, broken on behalf of you. Amen. And in the same way that he took the bread, he took the cup, and... He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, which is shed on your behalf. Amen, amen and amen. amen. What a blessing. Let that become to you the body and the blood of Jesus this morning. And feel, again, feel his love flowing into you with that bread and that wine. He is a good God beyond description, and he loves you beyond your ability to even comprehend it. Paul was St. Paul was always praying that the people would have the uh, revelation to have the ability to comprehend the height and breadth and depth and width of God's love. Amen. 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 You got anything you want to say, Liz? Yes. Hello. How is everybody? I miss you guys. <laughs> we, we really do miss you. Thanks again for the communion, Kathy, and thanks to everybody. God bless you. Where It's not going to be as long as it has been. Let's pray again. Father, in Jesus' name, bless everyone within the sound of my words this morning. Bless them with a special anointing, a, a special ability to perceive your profound love for them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bye, guys. Bye. See you next week.